Thank you very much. Uh, so before we do the next fractography session, there's actually a, a talk before, um, also by myself, <laughs> um, just to give you a break. I know it's hard to let it go now, but if you could just save your, your beautiful work, I promise I won't keep you long and we go back and play around with the brain a bit more. So, um, Yes, just close, close track this for a minute. Uh, I show you what we can do with it in the clinic. And then we come back and do the association pathways. Right, so what can we do with tractography in the clinic? Um, now you all experts of how to track, um, but let's step back and actually look at the methods that we have available to us to study the brain and brain pathologies. So in the top, we have clingular dissections, which you heard about earlier today. We have histological methods. We have axonal tracing, which is also a method to look at the connectional anatomy, but again, post-mortem and usually in um, animals, monkeys mostly. Um, for ethical reasons. We have MUG and EUG methods, TMS, TDA, TDCS. We have direct electrical cortical stimulation and we have MRI. Now, those can broadly be separated into two groups. And one group looks mainly at the, um, the structure of the brain and the other group looks at the function of the brain. Now, some of you might think why I uh, cut through MRI. And the reason for that is that MRI is such a versatile tool that we can actually use it for many, many different things. We can look at the structure and the function of the brain. So this is a broad categorization between the methods. There's also a difference in terms of the spatial and the temporal resolution. Those are basically fancy words for saying you see when things happen and you see where things happen. And depending on the method you use, you have a higher or lower temporal and spatial resolution. Now I wanna give you examples of what that actually means. <clears throat> so this is taken from a publication from 2018 um, where we imaged um, stroke patients. And you see this is the same patient or different modalities. We have the CT scan on the left a um, classical T1 weighted structural scan is the second image. Then you have a diffusion weighted imaging scan, a T2 flare, which is a clinical pathological acquisition, and then PCASA, which is a perfusion scan. Now, what I want you to try and do in your mind for now is to try and see if you can spot the lesion on the CT once you feel kind of confident, um, once you feel confident, move on to the T1, try to find the lesion, the DWI, and so on and so forth. Now, I guess we can all agree that the lesion on some of the scans is easier to identify. For example, on the flare or the, the perfusion scan, is even without being an expert where the lesion is, you can see it quite well. So on the CT scan, the lesion is here. But it's, if you had to draw um, a lesion delineation around it, it's actually quite hard to know where exactly to draw the boundary. And also easy to miss, there's also a bit of lesion up here towards the frontal lobe. Now, if we move over to the two one, you can see the lesion is right here. The boundary compared to the CT is a lot crisper. So drawing a lesion delineation here should be easier. And we also nicely see if you compare the left and the right, you see that there's definitely something going on here. Now, when we come to the diffusion, the lesion is very obvious. Diffusion is highly sensitive to stroke lesions, especially in the acute stages. And we can also see that the frontal lobe has taken a hit here. So <clears throat> that's one thing, trying to delineate the lesion. There's def different um, spatial resolutions and temporal resolutions. So it's easier or harder depending on the contrast that you use. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight here is that the lesion extent sometimes reaches far into the white matter here, but we have no means of determining based on those images 
which white matter pathways are actually affected by the lesion. So none of these methods allow us to pinpoint which specific tract is affected. We can argue based on all these images that the white matter would be implicated by this lesion, but we don't know the actual extent and which white matter. So why do we need to visualize the tracts other than just putting a name to it? Here's three main reasons. The first one is that we can use it to explain atypical cases. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second, but it's basically patients who present with a clinical presentation that doesn't match um, what you would expect from lesion studies, classical lesion studies. We can use it to do disconnection symptom mapping. And you've seen a little bit of that in the first talk this morning. And my personal favorite, we can use it to map inter individual variability. So let me give you the example of a atypical case. So what you see here on the left is a patient with a brain tumor. And that patient presented with a dense broker aphasia. And that means that patient was able to comprehend, understand spoken language, but could not articulate. So the understanding was intact, but the articulation was not. Now, looking at the classical structure, the T1 scan on the left, we can see that the tumor is not impacting on Broca's area in the frontal lobe, which we learned yesterday here. It's that M shape in the inferior frontal gyrus right here. And that is classically associated with um, Broca's aphasia and language functions. So based on, on the structure scan, this would be an atypical patient presenting with the symptom, but a mismatch on the scan. When we do, however, look at the individualized structography in that patient, we can see that, yes, the tumor might be far removed from Broca's area, but the edema around the tumor is actually encroaching onto the lung and the anterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus. So this would now explain why the patient presents with um, language deficits in the absence of a lesion in Broca's area. Now, the second point I want to make is that we can, once we identify the tracts, map symptoms onto tracts. And the example I want to give you here is that imagine a lesion on the insular cortex. So I'm just going to put it here so you roughly know where the insula is. The insula, for those of you who've never heard of it, if you can see me, so this is the lateral surface. If you open the sylvian fissure, the insular cortex is just hidden in there. So if we have a lesion there, if that lesion extends ventrally, it will impact on the optic radiation. That's the orange fiber track that you can see here. And that would lead to symptoms like hemianopia or visual agnosia. If, however, that lesion extends more medially, it will then impact on the cortical spinal tract and most likely cause a hemiparesis or somatosensory deficits. If we extend dorsally, here we go, dorsal, um, that lesion now impacts the arcuate fasciculus. So we would expect to see um, language deficits in those patients. So an insular lesion can be many different things depending on where the lesion is actually extending to. So the point I want to make here is that you need to know your white matter to associate disconnection and symptom. The other point I want to make here is that you can see that there is a lot of um, white matter that is not classified. So that is areas in the brain. No, my headphones just died on me. Here we go. That should work. Can you still hear me? Thank you, Nicole. Um, right, uh, where was I? The unnamed white matter. So there's a lot of areas in the brain that you can see here where we plotted the atlas from Marco and Michel from 2012. And there's a lot of areas in the brain that haven't been mapped in this atlas. Now, a lot of things have happened since then. And actually, newer atlases look more like this. So with advanced methods, we can now 
cover a lot more of the brain. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because you need to know your methods, especially if you use an atlas, you need to know what you can and what you cannot do with it. And the point I want to make here is that just because an atlas doesn't tell you there is white matter, it doesn't mean there is no tract. Okay, so always be aware of the methods you're using and how to interpret them. And in the one of the last lectures today, I will go through the details of the do's and don'ts, and that is definitely a do. Do check what methods you're working with. Right, finally, I said we can map variability, and you've seen the slide already, so I can go through it quickly, but we can actually map the individual variability on a brain by brain basis. Now, what is quite exciting was the work that we did back in 2018, where we mapped the inter-individual variability of the brain across a cohort. So what you see on the top row is the variability of the gray matter. And then very excitingly on the bottom row, you see the first ever white matter map of variability. And here, the classical color coding, the hotter the color, the more variability and the colder the color, the less variability. And what you can appreciate is that there's areas of hotspots where there's a lot of variability and areas of low variability. When we look at the white matter in the bottom row, um, you can see that there's a gradient. And the gradient is basically the older parts of the brain, the more central parts of the brain are less variable and the more lateral parts of the brain or the associative cortices with the link to higher cortical functions tend to be more variable. So this, is, this was super exciting, but the next step that we wanted to achieve is to see if this variability actually has a clinical cognitive meaning. So we did this it was supposed to be a quick project, it turned out to be <laughs> quite substantive, a meta-analysis of 326 studies where we looked at the structural variability and the differences in cognitive functions in healthy control neurological and psychiatric patients. And there's three things here that I want you to take away from this slide. And the first one is, that most of what we know about the connection anatomy of the brain from tractography, we actually know from patients. So the majority of studies were conducted in neurological patients followed by psychiatric patients, and only 25% were done in healthy controls. And the second point I want you to take away is that not all tracts are studied equally in the literature. So we can see that the uh, Top dog in the field is the cortical spinal tract, followed by the uncinate fasciculus, the corpus callosum, and so on and so forth. But when we come to the end of the scale, you see, for example, a combofrontal pathway that is hardly being um, studied in the literature. Now, there's two possible main reasons why that could be. Number one is that the anatomy is less well-defined and people are less aware of it. The other possibility is that with current methods, some of these tracts might just be difficult to dissect in the living human brain. Right, so we know it's a sensitive tool. Um, and this is the third thing I want you to take away from the study, namely that variability in anatomy is related to variability in cognitive profiles. And importantly, when the connection is damaged, it causes variability in clinical symptoms that mirror the functional profile. And I want to zoom in because I appreciate this um, particular slide is hard to read and busy, but I'm just gonna zoom in on one tract. So if we look at the arcuate fasciculus here, you can appreciate that it correlates not just with language, which is something we already know, but it also has been shown to be implicated with sleep, memory, executive functions, auditory functions, attention, and motor functions. And then obviously when disconnected also with clinical symptoms of various sorts. Now, what you can also see is that not 
every segment of the orchid is equally impacted across the profile. So what we can see from the study is that, yes, tractography is a sensitive tool to study variability, and there seems to be a correlation with cognitive clinical um, differences. So the first study to actually show the um, impact of connectional variability and clinical measures was this study that we did in 2014, where we basically looked at stroke patients with aphasia, so their inability to understand or articulate language. And we were able to demonstrate that taking anatomical variability into account doubles the accuracy of predicting recovery. So what you see on that graph on the left is the language recovery six months after symptom onset plotted against the size of the orchid in the healthy right hemisphere. And I'm just going to show you three of the patients. So on the left of the graph, you see patient number one. And when you look at the tractography reconstruction, patient number one is on the top. And we can appreciate that this 59-year-old uh, man did not really recover um, from his aphasic symptoms six months after symptom onset. And the connection in the right hemisphere is rather thin. If we move on to patient number two, who recovered slightly better, we can see that now the connection is slightly thicker in the right hemisphere. And patient number three, who's actually in that range of fully recovered, so according to a neuropsychological assessment, no more perceivable deficits, that lady had a really thick, strong connection in the right hemisphere. Now, what's important here is that usually language recovery is predict predictable to somewhere between 30 to 40 percent, depending on uh, which literature you, you read, based on clinical and demographical data. Now, what we were able to show here is that controlling for all these factors, we can actually double the prediction by adding in the variability of the orchid fasciculus in the right healthy hemisphere. So this was, this was super exciting and the first study to, to show that, um, but I wanted to extend this work. I also wanted to combine tractography with cortical measures to explore the concept of white matter and language pathologies in neurodegeneration. So this is a study in primary progressive uh, aphasic patients. Um, so this is patients who have a neurodegenerative disorders and they progressively lose their language abilities. And one of the symptoms they can present with is known as conduction aphasia. So that is an, a type of aphasia where the patient can understand language, they can articulate language, but what they cannot do is repeat what they heard. And classically for the last 150 years, it was hypothesized that the archaeid fasciculus is responsible or damage to the orchid fasciculus is responsible for conduction aphasia because it's disconnecting the superior temporal lobe or vanicus area and the frontal lobe or Broca's area. So both areas are still intact. That's why you can understand and why you can articulate. But the communication between those two areas via the orchid fasciculus was hypothesized to be damaged and therefore the transfer didn't work when you wanted to repeat what you had. So we looked at this both in terms of the white matter and the gray matter associated with the language areas, and you can see the images here on the slide, and correlated all of them with repetition deficits. And what you can appreciate on the, um, on the bottom row on the left is that the arcuate fasciculus, the direct segment, so it, that is shown in red on the top image, which is the main straight pathway between Broca's and Wernicke's, did not correlate at all with repetition. But when you look at the indirect pathway, so now we're taking together the green and the yellow, so that's the anterior and the posterior segment connecting frontal parietal and parietal temporal language areas, we can see the correlation with repetition. 
In terms of the cortical areas, the only area that survived multiple comparison correction was the superior marginal gyrus. And you remember that was at the end of the Sylvian fissure. So what we have to do now is to update our model of conduction aphasia in the brain. And it seems to be more the indirect pathway rather than the long pathway. So this led us to propose a new model of conduction aphasia, 150 years after the original one, whereby the different flavors of repetition deficits can be explained by lesions that are along that network. So you can have a lesion in the um, uh, inferior frontal gyrus, you can have a lesion along the anterior segment, you can have a lesion in the parietal uh, cortex that is uh, impacting on the anterior and posterior or just one of the two and you can have a lesion in the temporal lobe that is impacting on the posterior um, segment of the arcuate. So this now actually summarizes a lot of the discrepancy in the literature where people can present with lesions to different lobes and have repetition deficits, but it can also account for the various different flavors that we see in repetition deficits, because some of them might be more frontal and some of them might be more parietal related deficits. So the take home message, uh, visualizing connections is important because it helps us to explain atypical cases. I've shown you that tractography is a sensitive tool to map variability. Most of what we know originates from clinical populations. That is uh, important to bear in mind. And I have shown you that the variability in anatomy is related to variability in cognitive profiles. And that accounting for this variability actually improves our predictive um, models. Right. Happy to take your questions and we can move on to the next round of dissections. You stop the screen sharing. So I guess the next steps are to keep tracking different conditions to continue to improve our understanding. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, there is a lot of conditions and a lot of white matter as I've shown you that are not tracked yet. So keep tracking and keep connecting the brain. Sahba, just to say that was excellent. It explains so much about the variability you see in clinical presentations with patients with similar lesions. Thank you. Oh, you are welcome. Julian, do you think some of the functions attributed to one area are just wrong because of the individual variability in anatomy? Um, the, the very short answer is yes. <laughs> The longer answer is that um, most of what we know, A, comes from clinical patients, but also um, neuroimaging has a habit, and that is due to methodological limitations that we had to deal with for, well, since it was invented, basically, um, that we show the functioning of the brain on a group level, on the template. And by definition, what you do in that case, and in particular with functional imaging, is that you smooth your data. And by smoothing your data, you get rid of the inter-individual variability. And the smoothing actually just serves the purpose of smoothing out the variability. So to give you an example, um, if we take Heschel's gyrus, for example, um, you can have one or up to three Heschel gyri. A template only has one. So if you're one of those people who have two or three, that brain has to be squeezed into the template to make it fit. Um, and that obviously will introduce some variability and bias. So that was the long answer to that question. Mm -hmm.